wonderful. That's great. Hello, hello. Oh my God, it's so good to see everyone. Hi, I hope uh, everyone is um, well and healthy uh, this evening. Uh, I know some communities had some pretty heavy uh, storms last night. Hopefully everybody's okay and uh, their, uh, their uh, community is safe and, and well. Um, thank you all for, for joining us tonight. Um, we have a really, I think, um, a special opportunity. You know, um, tonight's guest, we have, you know, Heather Weirvaught on the line with us with DPI, and she was really instrumental and has a long history in terms of knowing about just how the process works in terms of election code. And sometimes I think for some of us at this end of it, it can be a bit of a mystery um, and, our, and or a challenge. And there were some things that were enacted in this last legislative cycle um, and, and that Heather was really a, a spearheaded that really, I think, improves the process um, uh, as we look to November in 2020 and actually gives some power back to the county chairs um, that I think is, is really important. And I, I appreciate you everybody jumping on the, the call tonight so that you can learn firsthand about some of these changes uh, that are in the election code and how they impact us and some of the things that we can do to make sure that the election that's coming in November 2020 is fair and uh, successful for our side. So take it away, Heather. Sure. Hi. Thank you guys very much uh, for letting me come and, and chat with you a little bit. So um, just for anybody who isn't familiar, the General Assembly passed an election omnibus bill when they were in special session um, two weeks, gosh, now two weeks ago, I guess, almost three weeks ago. Uh, and <clears throat> what they did was they made a, a, I would call it really a bunch of changes that are specific to this upcoming election. And many of the changes were based on problems that they were anticipating could um, go into effect uh, because of if there's a second wave of COVID outbreak or things that they saw during the primary, which as, as everyone knows, you know, the state still had to hold regardless of the fact that we were in the middle of a pandemic. So um, the, both the governor's office, the speaker's office, and the president's office, all three of them worked together with the House Democratic Women's Caucus and the Senate Women's Caucus. And then with a couple of outside lawyers, uh, we consulted with some county clerks specifically, to, um, specifically in some of the Democratic stronghold areas and some of the Republican stronghold areas so that we could put together a package that hopefully will work toward um, giving everybody some enhanced access, particularly to vote by mail for this election. So I'd be remiss if I didn't say this because I don't think a lot of people know this, but Illinois has actually the most liberal laws in the country when it comes to voting and vote by mail um, and your ability to cast a ballot in a precinct. No other state in the country offers the variety of ways to vote or the ability to vote as we do, which I think is a huge, huge kudos to uh, what we do here in Illinois. And so what we, did, what we did with these changes for this coming election actually make us even more so one of the states where we should have um, uh, really great access for those who have, so, so the people have an ability to vote. So let me walk through some of the major changes. And, and I think you all received a document that kind of gave you a quick overview of, of what's in the bill. But let me highlight a couple of the main things, particularly as it relates to vote by mail. So um, with vote by mail, one thing that is, is sort of critical is there's a date. It's normally August 5th, by which election, author election authorities cannot accept vote by mail applications until that date. What the bill does is it eliminates that date for this election and essentially says once the bill becomes effective, the election authority can start accepting vote by mail applications. The reason that's really important is it gives us almost a two month head start, or a month, now about a month and a half head start um, toward getting people, getting people to submit their applications to request a vote by mail ballot. And if you have questions, if you could put them in the chat, and then we'll make, we'll make sure to, to get to those and get those answered. Um, the, and the bill itself, by the way, has not been signed by the governor yet. The intention is that it'll likely be signed sometime later this week or early next week. But once that bill is signed, these provisions generally go into effect. And so people can immediately start requesting 
a ballot. Now, obviously, they're not going to get them right then, but they can they can go ahead and submit the application. And, and for those who aren't familiar with how the process works, in Illinois, you submit an application. That application, they do a signature check. So they look at the signature check on the application, and they look at the signature check on the ballot and or on it that's in the file, and they'll send it to you. There are some election authorities that don't require you to have a signature. They allow you to request a ballot by mail, or I'm, I'm sorry, by email, or by clicking a box um, on their website. That's all valid as well. So, so each county does it a little bit differently in terms of how they do it. But the requirement in Illinois, as in most every state, is you have to submit an application for a ballot. And then once they get the application, they process that application and then 90 days, I'm sorry, 40 days before the election, they can start mailing those ballots out. So what we did here was one, election authorities can start receiving those applications immediately. Second thing we did is we required that every election authority send an application to anybody who voted in 2018, 2019, or the 2020 primary. Um, the reason we picked those three elections is frankly because those are the most recent and the data that we have for them is the most, um, most coherent that when you put it all together, it works the best. Some people asked why we didn't go back to 2016. Part of the reason, and this is sort of getting the weeds, but in 2017, a lot of the election authorities purged their voter rolls. They usually do that after a presidential election. So we didn't want to get into a situation where we're arguing with the election authorities over, well, we didn't mail, we didn't have to do 2016 because we did a purge. And so we just, we just essentially said anybody who voted in 18, 19, or 20, you have to go ahead and, and affirmatively mail them an application. Um, that doesn't mean that other people can't apply. Obviously, anybody who is registered to vote can apply for a vote by mail application. But we wanted to start the process of, of having the election authorities go out and affirmatively remind people of the option for vote by mail and try to get as many people as possible to request a vote by mail ballot before um, things start to get really heavy in September and October. We also made sure that following up on, on that request, that um, letter happens. So the election authorities are going to send out a notice to everybody, essentially saying, here's a vote by mail application. There are going to be two mail pieces following that. Those two mail pieces are going to come from the Secretary of State's office. And those mail pieces will again say, you received a vote by mail application, please make sure you fill it out. If you need another one, here's where you can contact. If you want to fill out online, here's where you go. Um, and then they'll receive another one a few weeks later if they still didn't submit that application. So it's, it's sort of a state-sponsored chase program, if you will. But again, the goal is to push as many people as possible to vote by mail versus um, engaging in traditional election day activities or early voting. And the hope there is that if we do see a second round of wave of COVID, we can at least be sure that everybody had an opportunity to vote and we can try to get as many people out the door to vote before uh, we even have to deal with with any particular issues. One of the other things that is really important is so for new registrants, so um, anybody who's now going to register to vote, when they register, if they are registering on the online system, and by the way, 80% of people now use the online system versus the paper with the deputy registrars. So if they register online, when they register, they will get to check a box that essentially says, would you like your ballot mailed to you? So that will count as their application. So we're, we're sort of pushing and encouraging new registrants to vote by mail just by simply adding a checkbox on the process um, with, with, uh, uh, th for the new registrants. Um, we're also going, we also added a provision in the law that says every county has to make their vote by mail application available within 10 days of the effective date of the bill. So because they can start accepting them on day one, but they may not have the capability. You'd think they would, but let's be honest, some of them don't. They may not have the ability to just flip a switch and get it up online that next day. So we're giving them an opportunity, but they still have to have that form online available. They have to have it so that someone can download it if they want to. Someone can email and request it or email and just simply say, I'd like a ballot, or someone can mail in an application. So um, there, are, there should be on every county clerk's site you know, with hopefully within no later than two weeks of the bill passing, 
a location on the site where people can download the form or click to request a vote by mail ballot. Um, and last but not least related to this, and, and this is sort of jumping, putting the, the cart a little bit before the horse, but I just want to, I want to say this. One of the big problems that we've had with vote by mail is that you guys, and you probably have, have heard this or know this, but traditionally 10% of vote by mail application or vote by mail ballots get rejected. And they usually get rejected for things like the signature just don't match, or it showed up and the envelope was open, or it came a day late. There's a variety of reasons why a vote by mail ballot can be rejected. What we did in this bill was essentially add language that says, any ballot that is returned is presumed to be valid. There's a, a presumption of validity. And if you are going to disqualify a ballot, you have to have a three judge panel look at that ballot. And the only way you can reject a ballot based on a signature is if all three judges agree that that's a bad signature. So, so the reason why we did this is most of the, <laughs> most of the ballots that get rejected get rejected because, well, the person, the person that T went side, went to the left and in their driver's license, it goes to the right. So clearly this is a fraud. Um, we wanted to make it so that it was absolutely positively not something that is, uh, is questionable. You, you will know, and, and I don't know if any of you have done signature checks, but if you've ever done a signature check, you know a good signature and a bad signature. They're not, they're really not hard to spot. Very rarely are you going to look at it and be like, I don't know, maybe that is a forgery. So I, I think it's, I think this method will hopefully help in reducing the number of ballots that have been rejected. And to, to what Christina was saying, this is a place where you guys are going to have to play a huge role. The reason being what the bill does is it gives each county party the ability to select the judges that are going to be reviewing these signatures. So, so you know how you submit your list of election judges? What this does is this bill says that when they're assigning the judges who are going to be reviewing the vote by mail ballots, they have to select them from a special list selected by the county clerks. I'm sorry, by the county parties. So you will have the ability to submit a separate list of people who you want to be the ones that are reviewing these, these ballots. So, and I'm sure, sure you guys will go over this at another time, but you know, this is where you want your pit bulls. This is where you want your good people who are really going to be paying attention and are going to be, to know the rules, understand how the process works and make sure that, that we've got um, everything, everything moving forward with, with those. Um, and, and to me, that is probably one of the biggest and best advancements in this bill because I really think that that's going to go a long way toward making, um, making sure that we've reduced the number of, of uh, signatures that are, are rejected. A couple of other things I wanna to add to that real quickly that I, I sort of glanced over, but I should make sure you know. So a um, question that I see uh, that came up and that, that we've been asked, asked a lot is about postage. The bill does not require the election authorities to, to give postage paid ballots. But what it says is that you have to accept a ballot that is returned. What that means, so under federal postal rules, if someone drops a ballot in the mail and there's no postage on it, under federal postage rules, they still have to return that to the county clerk or to the election authority, whoever, wherever it's supposed to be going. The election authority then has the ability to say, we'll pay the postage or we won't pay the postage. What the bill does is the bill says they have to pay that postage. So they have to accept that ballot. So this, this is sort of, I'd call it the compromise, where instead of saying you have to, put po you have to accept the postage on, on every single ballot, uh, which frankly would, would blow a hole in a lot of counties' budgets, as you know, um, but we went sort of down the middle and simply said, if someone doesn't put postage on it or if someone can't afford to put postage on it, we want them to still turn that ballot in, and then we will ensure that the counties are, are collecting those ballots. A um, couple of other items to make sure that you're aware of. Every election authority is required to have a vote by mail, I'm sorry, a universal voting site on election day. So um, this is a big change from traditional law. Um, and I should have started by saying all the traditional rules still apply. They're still in precinct voting on election day. There's still same day registration. All of that is in effect. We just added some additional um, items to safeguard and to, to add to it. So every 
every county is going to have at least one universal voting site where anybody can go to visit. And the point of, of that is not only to make sure that there's one location where anyone can go to if, if they're you know, running late and it's almost seven o'clock and they haven't made it to a polling place, but also protection in the event that a polling place closes. There is some concern that because they're, they're, they've got one, that there may be some long lines at these locations. So you're gonna hear your, your election authorities encouraging people, you know, don't just go use this place. Like this, this shouldn't just be your first option. This should be sort of the, the place of last resort if you have an issue. So we should still be pushing people to vote in precinct, but know that we have this, this additional option. Um, we also added curbside voting. So uh, a lot of people don't know that Illinois already has curbside voting. So there's a provision in the code where if you have someone who is, is disabled, they have the ability to request someone come to their car and, and help them vote a ballot. We eliminated the, requi we eliminated the requirement that they can only do this in, in that circumstance. So essentially what we've done now is say that counties, they're required to do it for any individual who, who, has, um, some, who is unable to make it into the polling place, but they, they can also do it for any individual. So um, most counties, what, what, as we talked through with them, they liked this because it gave them the option, particularly if you have a polling place that's crowded, to have a couple of people outside to move the lines along faster. So the, it, the requirement is two election judges, one from each party, and they can assist the person at their car with voting the ballot. Next, and I see a couple of questions about this, um, drop, uh, drop boxes. So we also added a provision that allows the counties to establish vote by mail drop boxes. What this is, is um, right now under current law, you can't just, you can walk into a county and you can hand them your vote by mail ballot, but you have to hand it to someone and then they have to authorize it and, and essentially sign it right there as if they've received it. And for some voters, that means waiting in a line. What this is, is you can have a curbside box or a box at the clerk's office or a box at the library. You can have it pretty much, I mean, we left it very broad so that they could, they, they have to follow security requirements. It has to be a lock box. It has to be, um, they have to remove the ballots at the end of each day. They can't leave them there for, you know, weeks on end. Um, but they can, they can create these curbside boxes. And generally other states that have done this, what they do is, at the um, city center or at a library, they'll put boxes where people can go and drop their ballots in. So for the counties that are going to do curbside voting, I'm sorry, for the counties that are going to do drop boxes, no later than 40 days before the election, they're supposed to let everybody within that county know what the rules are going to be and how they're going to do this. So if, if my guess is you're going to have counties that say, we're not going to do that. We don't have the funds to, to come up with drop boxes right now. But I think you will have some counties that will that will implement these. Um, I'm just looking if there's anything else I want to make sure I postage paid. Oh, early voting. Um, we extended the hours for early voting. So early voting will will essentially beginning on the 19th October 19th go every day from 8:30 to 7 or from um, 9 to 5 on the weekends. So there's some enhanced hours for, for early voting across the board. There's still all the same requirements for early voting. Um, if you're in a county that has multiple locations, they're still required to have the multiple locations. They still have the ability to add locations if they'd like to, um, but, but we, didn't, we didn't reduce any of the requirements for, for voting sites. And then um, one of the last things I wanna talk about is, <coughs> excuse me, we wanted to make sure that there was a greater opportunity for the county clerks and the election authorities to recruit election judges for this for this election. So what we did was they eliminated the requirements on what we call teen judges. So under the code right now, a 16-year-old or 17-year-old can be an election judge, but they have to meet certain GPA requirements that frankly I wouldn't have even met when I was in high school. So we got rid of those. And essentially any 16 year old or 17 year old can serve as an election judge. Um, and, and we've also made election day a holiday, which means essentially you won't have school operating on an election day. So the goal is hopefully to shift some of those high school students and encourage them to serve as election judges um, to assist with, with the counties and assist the parties with having more election judges. We also uh, made sure that, that when it came to election training, we didn't, we didn't eliminate any of the requirements that were in place for election judge training. I, I know that that's one of the things that county clerks always ask. They always say, well, drop the training requirements. We didn't do that. 
we didn't make any changes to the way that election judges are assigned in terms of, of county clerks still get to submit their lists. And if you haven't done your list, I'm sure you're working with, with Dan and, and Chairman Christina uh, yeah, and Christina on those lists, but make sure you get those lists in. Um, so we didn't make any changes to anything that would impact that. I think the only other thing I would mention is um, within 10 days of the governor signing the bill, which as I said, hopefully will be sometime later this week or next week, the State Board of Elections is required to send out a mailer to every election authority, advising them of the bill and walking through all the provisions of the bill and making it crystal clear to them that this bill is this bill is essentially we're not replacing the current election we're taking all these provisions and putting it on top so if you happen to have an election judge an election authority that says oh well this means this is all i have to do i don't have to do in, in precinct voting obviously that's not true um but so the election authorities or the state board of elections should be advising the election authorities on the new bill and on the process the speaker's office and the president's office uh, along with the governor's office are working with the state board of elections on putting that memo together so hopefully it will make it crystal clear to the clerks exactly how they're supposed to do this process um, but as we all know sometimes they they don't necessarily abide by what those directions are uh, so what we are going to do from from the democratic party of illinois is once that memo goes out from the state board of elections we'll make sure to get it to all of you guys so that you have copies of that memo and you can see it and you know it and then it might be if, if you want to we can do another call after that point if if you have any questions if your clerks are asking you any questions if your election authorities are asking you any questions um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page and that we're sharing information but we will make sure to get that call to you through dan and christine to get that um document to you through dan and christina so you have a copy of it and then i'm just looking dan are there any questions that i missed yeah um just a couple of things yeah. real quick and i can go through some of the questions here uh chairs we will be uh posting this um on youtube later so that we can review if you have any follow-up questions and if you haven't received the memo that heather uh put together for us i can send that out again uh so please uh just let me know if you haven't received that yet uh so one question we have here is there a way for us to track if the clerk is denying ballots based on the signatures yeah so so one of the things that one of the benefits of having this enhanced system and this new um three judge panel is two things one you should have someone sitting there who's going to know what's what has been rejected so the, the clerk themselves the election authority themselves will no longer be just having a staffer review that and rejecting a ballot because of a signature you're going to have that three judge panel so one of your people should hopefully be sitting there and, and if someone gets rejected your person rejected it and they can explain to you like look this this was clearly not the same signature um, and also they're required to keep a list and they're required to make public the names of any individual that was rejected so if someone goes through that three judge panel and the three judge panel essentially says yep we agree this person is this is absolutely the signature does not match this might be a, a fraudulent ballot they're required to notify that person within two days and give that person the ability to respond and and rectify that so that their ballot gets counted so any individual who has a vote by mail ballot that is rejected should receive notification nearly immediately um, that there that there's a problem with their ballot so that they can rectify it okay several county parties are considering doing mailings for either vote by mail or for get out the vote efforts is there any suggestions that we can put on that to ensure that ballots are not rejected so the if you look at my the my lovely little background here that box that signature box number one reason why ballots get rejected make sure they sign it and date it if the, if the clerk has a date most people don't have dates there are some clerks who include a date they're not required to but they do so the number one thing you can do when you are trying to push people to vote by mail is make sure that they understand the instructions or if they don't understand the instructions for vote by mail that they have the ability to reach out to someone within your county party to get information I can tell you one of the things the House Democratic Women's Caucus plans on doing is they're gonna, we're gonna do some, I'm working with them on putting together some webinars and some YouTube tutorials on like how to do a vote by mail ballot. 
So what might be helpful for your county, because every county is different and every ballot is different, is to, to get a copy of that ballot and even ju just do something as simple as a tutorial for people if, if they need help. Or being able to you know, send someone a text picture of, this is the line you sign, make sure you date it here, <laughs> make, sure you, make sure you put the, put it in the envelope, seal the envelope, sign it here. Those are, the, those are the main reasons why a lot of those ballots get rejected. Okay. For the, the, the election judges, the, the pit bull judges, um, are we allowed to use our own precinct committee people for those positions or do they, uh, are they still prohibited as, um, as PCs to be election yes. judges? Yes, nope, they're prohibited. They have, it, it's, it's your traditional election judges. So it has to be someone who is not a party official, a precinct, a precinct committee person counts as a party official. So it has to be um, someone who can serve as an election judge. Okay. With the curbside voting, is that uh, optional or is that mandatory for the clerk? Optional. 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 Okay. Uh, I will tell you, though, that the Clerks Association, that was one of the things that they requested. And, and it came, ironically, I was kind of surprised, it was coming from a, a group of downstate clerks. So... So there's, there's, there is some interest from the clerk. So I, I do have a feeling that we'll have a good number of them that may implement it. Okay. And chairs, I see a lot of new uh, questions popping up. Just keep entering them into the chat and we'll get through them as quick as we can here. Is there uh, any additional support for the early voting locations uh, if the clerk's office doesn't have the budget for it? Yeah. So one of the things that we all we did with this bill and that um, is is going to happen for the clerks and the election authorities because of the federal COVID relief package, we put language in the bill that allows clerks to seek reimbursement for a variety of expenses related to the election that the state would normally not cover. So um, the state of Illinois received, I believe it's $14.9 million in CARES Act money. Um, $14.9 million doesn't go far, but it is, it is at least the start of something. And we're hearing that there's going to be an additional pot of money that could potentially be coming our way for election services. So one of the things the State Board of Elections is going to be doing, um, probably not in that initial memo that they're sending out, but they'll be notifying the clerks of what expenses they can, what expenses they can essentially um, submit to the State Board of Elections for reimbursement. And anything that ties directly to the, the pushing of vote by mail, um, enhanced hours of early voting to, ins to assist with um, like special hours, you know how stores do special hours for seniors during, during the COVID crisis. If they're going to do special hours for seniors during early voting to try and, and you know, separate the populations, those types of things. So there'll be a variety of things that they can seek reimbursement for, um, which, which isn't going to, by no means, cover all of the costs related to an election but um we do there was there was there were some calculations done and we do hope and think that it will at least cover the additional expenses that are going to be placed on election authorities because of this election i, I would say one of the other things that um you may ask or you you may be asked by your clerks or you may be interested in um, p things like ppe and hand sanitizer and special wipes for the election equipment the governor's office is going to be working with the State Board of Elections on the possibility of doing large procurements and working with the election authorities to make sure that all of those supplies are provided. And so, so, you know, with the COVID crisis, the governor's office procured most of those supplies and then sent them down to the county health departments. Um, with the February primary, because of the, because of the way everything happened so quickly, there wasn't a lot of coordination with getting those supplies and a lot of counties found themselves scrambling um, the goal is that the governor's office will be working with the State Board of Elections and the local county health boards to make sure that those supplies are going to be available for all the election judges and all the election facilities. Okay. So with the, the list of judges, like we normally have to turn in uh, by the end of the month to our county clerks, are we able to, um, to also have on there the, uh, the list of the, the three election judge panel or that specific uh, uh, those specific judges, they can be on both lists? Yeah, they have to be on both lists. So, so you're going to want whoever you're submitting is, you're going to have your list of, of people that you want to be election judges, and you're going to have your list of people that you want to be 
sort of the, these special election judges. They, they're, they likely should be on the same lists because if they're, if they're going to be an election judge, you likely want them to be one of the special election judges too. Um, but yeah, you're going to get to submit a separate list and, and you're going to need to ask your county exactly how they want that done. Um, I know some of us, so like for Cook, for example, we're, we get to submit the list of election judges and then just designate on there which ones we want as our special judges. So you, sh you should probably have a conversation with your clerk just to make sure how they want you to accept them. But the point is that you would get to pick. So it's not the clerk that's picking who that three judge panel is. You get to pick your you know, top 30 judges or top 40 judges that you want to be in that pile, in that, in that group of people that get picked to be on that special panel. Okay, and we have by a, a voter protection question with vote by mail. Um, if, you, if individuals had uh, applied for a vote by mail ballot but did not receive their ballot, what should the county chair do in those instances? Yeah. So if they apply for a ballot and they don't receive the ballot, um, they, they or you can contact the county and find out, you know, where's the ballot? Why didn't they get it? If it is less than five days before the election and they still haven't gotten the ballot, that's a person that you need to get into early vote. Either They either need to go early vote or they need to vote on the election day because my view is always if it hasn't come within five days before the election, it's either not coming because something happened with the mail or there's, there's you know, some, some other issue. Um, I like to encourage people at that point, just try to get them into early vote or try to get them to vote on election day. The rule is if you requested a vote by mail ballot and you did not receive it, when you show up to vote, you get to vote a regular ballot. They're going to make you fill out an affidavit that simply says, I never received my ballot. You fill that out, you sign it, they give you a regular ballot. The fact that you did not receive a ballot does not mean you have to cast a provisional ballot. And that's one of those rules that a lot of people don't, they miss. And counties often tell people, oh, just cast a provisional ballot. And I hate provisional ballots. Provisional ballots are the worst in my view. They should only be used in a very limited situation because those ballots don't get counted until much later than everything else. So if a person has the ability to cast a regular ballot, you're really going to want to push them to request that they be able to cast, cast a regular ballot. Okay, and, and chairs, we're kind of wrapping up here. So if, again, if you have any other questions, drop them in the chat. Uh, with the early voting hours, Heather, are there are those early voting hours, the expansion of those hours, is that mandatory for the clerks or is that that's mandatory? No, nope, that's mandatory. So that's mandatory for what are called their permanent early voting sites. So every county has what are what are their permanent sites, which is usually their their main office where they're conducting um, early voting. Most, elect, most counties also have what are called temporary sites. So the additional sites that they sent up, set up, some of these are designated as permanent sites, which means they operate every day. And some of these are like, you'll call, I call them traveling sites. You know, like we're at the library on Tuesday and we're at the school on Wednesday type thing. Those temporary sites don't have to have those hours, but permanent sites, every permanent site has to follow these new hours. Okay. Uh, here's one that I know we, we get questions on uh, just on the staff side. What is the, the makeup of the, the election judges? Not just the, the three judge panel that we'll have for vote by mail, but the election judge makeup in the precinct. Is it yeah. you know, three to two, three Republicans and two Dems, three yeah. Dems? Yeah, it, so, the so, it, so the rule is technically you can flip. So you can have, as long as you have, you can have three, two, you can have two, three. Um, it, it's, it's really up to the clerk in terms of, of the assignments and what they have available to them. So the, the problem that a lot of people find is, well, I'm in a county that's, you know, Republican. And so they're going to make everybody two, th two or three, two uh, th Republican versus Dems. So what am I supposed to do? Unfortunately, that, that there's just not a lot you can do in that situation. Um, they have the ability. There's always going to be, you're always going to have the, you're always going to have the opportunity where you're potentially going to have one extra judge from a different party. Um, who may be the tiebreaker judge, and that's 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 unfortunately just the reality of it. And then it'll be two two to one on the three judge panel, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, no, just to be clear, but for signatures, it's three out of three. Yeah, three out of three to vote, but the the partisan breakdown. Correct. 
the three judge panels is Correct. at least two to one. Yes, okay. yes, yes. At least at least two of one. Yes. Okay. Um, on the drop boxes, if the county clerks decide they want to implement that ch uh, that change, it's time. Are those drop boxes protected by federal or state law? Uh, those are state. Those are state law. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. And there's a provision in the bill that essentially says they have to be lock boxes. They have to be um, uh, picked up every day. They have to be initialed. The individual, uh, it ha the, the clerk's office has to actually keep a list of where if they got the ballot from a lock box versus if it was something that was just dropped off at the at the facility. Okay. All right, I think that's all the questions that we had. Uh, we could follow up offline with any other ones. So I will uh, turn it back over President Zahorek uh, to kind of wrap up our, uh, our training for this evening. So again, thank you, Heather, so much. You're such a font of information. <laughs> and I think like many of our county chairs who are volunteers and just stepped up into to these positions, there's a lot of information that we know and there's a lot that we don't know, right? So this has been very, very helpful. And just to, to underline and underscore, you know, right now our county parties are collecting from our PCs that have been elected or appointed, as well as just other volunteers coming in, our election judges, our democratic election judges. And uh, we have the ability to make these appointments to our election authorities. And this special kind of grouping of, you know, watchdog judges, um, again, is really important to make sure that we are in that space and in that room when they're determining and deciding whether or not these ballots are, are acceptable or not acceptable. So I think, again, that's really important. And not only do we want them to be watchdogs and know, have, have some backbone and spine, but I would also encourage who, those folks that you are selecting also are folks that you can get along with to some degree, right? Can be cordial and, right? That's also part of this. Um, um, and again, you know, uh, we're here to be helpful at the IDCCA to make sure that we all uh, know kind of what the plan is ahead of us. And uh, Heather, again, thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Um, and thank you for making the election code uh, better. Um, and uh, again, if there's any questions, you know, we're here to, to answer them. And there's no question too big and no question too small. So thank you so much.